This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. We're still on the subject today of the shepherd staff. We found out a lot that was hidden in the original Hebrew in the last session. And I want to go back again and revisit 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 through 49. I really think we do ourselves a disservice if we don't take the time to properly understand the culture in which the Word of God is has been written, that it wasn't written in a vacuum, it wasn't written up here somewhere in Detroit or the foothills of Tennessee, it was written among the sons of Abraham, the Hebrews. And so there are many things, there are many concepts with properly understanding that the Hebrew paints pictures, they use contrasts. Uh, the, in fact, you can see in the writings of the Apostle Paul, uh, I think it was the Hebrews that, that uh, developed the whole concept of shock and awe when they were doing their debates and, and these type of things. And contrasting is a normal expression that once you begin understanding it, you know, it's like when we look at the book of Proverbs. There's two women in Proverbs is what the whole book of Proverbs is about. There's the righteous woman that is wisdom contrasted to the harlot of Babylon. And when you really understand that, the, the book of, of, of Proverbs can be a very dark book because he warns about how that she will lure you in and once you get big by the mystery Babylon bug, which Solomon did, by the way, that uh, it can cause all kinds of problems in your life. And unfortunately today, much of the church is swimming in the cesspool of mystery Babylon thinking they're having church. But in this contrasting, we find the Apostle Paul writing in 1 Corinthians, and he says, So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, and that the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. You see the contrasting. Carnal flesh of the earth, of the Spirit of God. One brought death, one's bringing life. One was the bad shepherd we found out in, in our last session. And when, so when Jesus was saying, I was the good shepherd, he, he was contrasting himself to Adam. And it goes on here, it says, However, the spiritual is not first but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also those that are made of dust. As is the heavenly man, so are those who are heavenly. So he's saying, listen, there's the old man, there's the new man. When you got saved, you got a new man. There's a new person living on the inside of you, recreated in the image of Christ. That is opposed to the old man. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, 
we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. This is something that the church has forgotten. Instead of trying to bear the image of that heavenly man, we have warped our theologies so that our picture of Jesus matches who the man of dust is. The old man, rather than saying, I need to change and I need to conform to him. That's part of what this shepherd's staff is. Now let's go on to Romans chapter 5. I love the book of Romans. One of these days I just may do an, an expositional verse by verse through the book of Romans, but one of those things that we would, you know, we're, we're approaching, understanding the kingdom, 60 and 7. I think this is episode number 60, A and B. If I start doing the book of Romans, we would have part number 274 because there's so much in it and so much being misinterpreted. If you can't view the book of Romans through first century rabbinical eyes and understand how a rabbi presents an argument, you misinterpret all of the book of Romans. I want to start here in verse 6. This one, anytime the devil gets in your face, and you, how many know that we fall every once in a while? We trip. Now, when, when our children are learning how to walk, do you slap them down when the first time they try to get up and walk, and, and they take a step or two and tumble, and you say, you old dirty thing, you're never going to walk again, and you're just hopeless case? No, you're learning. We have to learn. We, we're, we're, we are so well disciplined in the old man. You don't even have to think to do it. But walking in the new man is a daily conscious effort. And the Apostle Paul reminds us, for when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Didn't die for the godly, he died for the ungodly. When you had no strength. Strength of what? Strength of the new man. Strength of the Spirit of God on the inside. When you were without strength, God sent Jesus and Jesus died on the cross for us. And here's the contrasting looking at human nature. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone might even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us for that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, have we been saved from wrath through him. How many know wrath is not only when you start pouring out the bowls of God's wrath in the book of Revelation, but how many know hell represents the wrath of God? We've been saved from that wrath. Verse 10 again, unbelievable. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Now, I want you to underline in your Bibles, while well, if when we were enemies. Everybody that has not bowed the knee to Jesus and the real Jesus and really bowed their knee and surrendered to him are an enemy of the cross. They're an enemy of the kingdom. Before you made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, you were filled with the iniquity force. You were an enemy to the kingdom of God. And one of the things that really is concerning me is we live in a day that the enemies are beginning to develop the theology of the church. And that needs to stop. Bless, he doesn't stop there. Much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through the Lord Jesus Christ, though whom we have now received the reconciliation. 
Reconciliation, that's an important word. Now, I'm already going off my notes, but we need to understand this. Let's say that uh, Michael Rodhouse and I got into a real big huff and we ended up as bitter enemies. Okay? I mean, just I'd rather slap him down than to even look at him. I mean, it's just Hatfields and McCoys. Okay? Now, he can choose to forgive me. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. Just because he forgives me doesn't mean that we can have a relationship. Reconciliation is about restoring the relationship. How does the relationship be restored? I come to him and I say, I was wrong. I apologize. However I have wronged you, if, if, if it cost you money, whatever it cost you, I want to make this thing right. I'll never, I see the error of my ways. I repent, not only to God, but to you. For how boneheaded I was and how stubborn I was. And I want to be reconciled to you because I was wrong. That's a part of salvation. That it's not just getting forgiveness of sin. To get forgiveness, you've got to say, I was wrong. You were right. God was right. We were wrong. Why do we keep telling God how he should do things instead of letting him, the one that had never been wrong, tell us how things should be? That, that's a part of reconciliation. It's not just forgiveness and you're on the outer court. He wants you to come and sit at the, at, the, at the foot of his throne and to fellowship with him. That's reconciliation. Come tell me about your day. How are you really feeling? What's going on? That's reconciliation. I just felt like somebody needed to hear that today. Therefore, just... As through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned, for, un, for unto the law sin was in the world, but sin, is, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Okay, so that people try to say, well, if there is no law, then there is no concept of sin. Bull hockey. You just don't know it's sin, but what he's, going to, what he's going to read here, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Moses was a watershed event. Even though man didn't know that he was sinning, he was dead in his trespasses and sin, and death absolutely reigned. And the only thing that stopped it in history before the cross was Moses. Therefore, the church needs to take its hat off to Moses and quit bashing him. Even those who had not sinned according to to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is the type of him who is to come. But the free gift is not like the offense, for if by one man's sin offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abound to many. So there's contrasting here. Adam, the old man, the new man, Christ, death on one side, life on the other. And the gift is not like that which came from the one who sinned. How is it different? You didn't decide to be a sinner. Since Adam, all of us were born with that nature. We just didn't get up one day and said, I'm going to be bad, mean, and ugly. Honey, it just comes naturally. It's part of your nature. That's because one is by default. The other is by choice. You got to choose Jesus. You got to choose life. 
because it can only, it's, it's not received because it's embedded into your DNA, which means mommy and daddy can't walk with God for you. There came a time in Isaac's life that Isaac had to dig his own wells. In other words, he had to develop his own relationship with God. And it happens around 13, the age of accountability. Yeah, at that, 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 that moment, and what, what's interesting is that a bar mitzvah. Now the child, from the time that they could understand language up to that 13th birthday, they've been taught the ways of God. And they have to prove to the community that they understand the Word of God. And so after the community says, yes, you have now become a man or a bat mitzvah, or you have now become a woman, the father drops to his knees and says, I thank you, Lord, that he's now responsible for his own sins because it used to be on daddy's shoulders, okay? But what that also means is at that moment, you stepped off your mom and dad's coattails as far as them going to church and trying to walk with God. You need to make the decision for yourself that you've got to develop that relationship with God. For the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace. Now underlying the next, this is critical in understanding this. And the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Now hear me. We got a lot of people preaching grace today as an excuse to sin. If there has not been established in that individual's life biblical righteousness, then there is no grace. They are twin components. When grace kicks in, righteousness is the natural response to grace. When you get touched by grace, you're not looking for a way to sin. You're looking how to overcome sin and never do it again because you're not walking with the old man. You're walking with the new man. And that gift is so precious to you that you don't want anything to ever come between you and the Father. And you don't want to ever bring reproach on his name. We've dealt with this here about what it means to carry the name of God. Taking the name of God in vain means your stinky attitudes causes disgrace upon the name of God. And that's being done in the earth today by what's going on in a lot of sections of the body of Christ. I ought to write a book about that, just grace and righteousness. If you ain't got righteousness, you ain't got grace. That's the way we'd say it in the Ozarks. Therefore, as though one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Justification. Another big theological word. And I could go on for hours and, and looking at the whole doctrine of justification, but I like it just this way, okay? Over here, I was a sinner. Cut off from God, enemy of God, damned for a devil's hell. The devil used me like a puppet, and he was, and he was Geppetto. That all, they, all the demons had to do was push my buttons, and I would do whatever they do. And I had no defense against it. But the day that I dealt with the cross, and I made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of my life, I stepped over here and I've got a new man. That new man has been reconciled to the Father. The day you got saved in the Spirit, you were born again, your spirit man was made alive, and Jesus presented you to the Father saying, there's a newborn kid in the kingdom of God. I want to present to you Michael Lake on the day that I got saved. Now, he's rough around the edges, Dad. 
But we have a destiny for what he's supposed to do in the kingdom. He may be a little stuck on stupid right now, but he's kind of young. One of these days, 30s, 40s, 50s, he'll grow up. And when he does, watch what I can do through him. You see, I'm crucified with Christ, never let I live, yet it's not I, it's Christ living in me. So any good thing that I have ever done from the point that I've gotten saved has been Jesus. Every stupid thing that I have done, and you got to be careful with that stupid button because sometimes it does get stuck, okay, has been the old Mike Lake that keeps trying to crawl off the cross and have his way. Let's keep on going. Verse 20, moreover, the law entered that the offense of one might abound. What does that mean? So that we would know what sin is. See, the interesting thing about Torah, which we unfortunately translate as law, and we don't derive that from the Greek, we don't derive it from the Hebrew, we derive it from Roman and Latin, by the way, because it literally means either how to hit the mark or the loving instruction of the Father. But it not only reveals to us what sin is, it reveals to us what righteousness looks like when it's in motion. Did you ever see those, there's one of the popular things, of course you can tell I've not read it, about eat this, not that, especially if you want to lose weight. I kind of ignore that just a little bit too much. But it's saying, bad for you, good for you, bad for you, good for you. The negative commandments don't do bad for you. The good commandments, when you do it, you get good results. You see, God was the originator of do this, not that. He holds the copyright on it. And it has everlasting results. Not only in this life, the life to come. Moreover, the law entered... That, uh, that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Even under the law, where it revealed what sin was, there was a stopgap solution on the Day of Atonement and sin offerings until Abraham's promised lamb would come. Jesus, the ultimate not stopgap, permanent solution for sin. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign, grace might reign, grace might reign through righteousness. How does grace reign? It reigns on a platform of righteousness established within you. The Apostle Paul in the book of Romans has already dealt with the rabbis who had been trained their whole life the commandments of God. And he said, here's here's your problem. You can't keep it. You try and you all, and and they literally create a fence. That's one one of the concepts of Talmud. They create this fence around Torah. They create 500 rules about keeping the one rule of God. And so now you have 501 rules. And you can't keep the one, much less the 500. He said, you've studied it your whole life. You've you've tried to, to conform the old man to not sin, and it doesn't work. But he said, then here's these Gentiles that you believed were as filthy as pigs, as filthy as shrimp and lobster and all of Peter's vision. The reason God showed Peter lobster and shrimp and all that, because within the mind of the Jewish individual, first century, they were just as filthy and unclean as a hog wallering in its own filth. That's why they would, if they would go into a Gentile house, they were considered unclean. That was the mindset back then. And so God had to get Peter's attention. Peter's vision was shock and awe. And it wasn't about changing your diet. It was so that Gentiles through Christ were made clean. 
which is what he's talking about here. And so Paul says to the, to the rabbis, you studied your whole life and you can't keep it. Now here's some guys that haven't had a chance to study it yet. But here's the mystery. Out of their new nature, they're keeping what you can't keep. I have had people, the Bible says that we would provoke the Jews to jealousy. And they shout, you know, well, we just need to get rich enough. You can't. Right now, 90% of the world's wealth is held by several families, and one of them is Jewish. But the Rothschilds, although they need to abandon Luciferianism, embrace Messiah. You can't get enough money. What is going to provoke them to jealousy is by the power of the blood of Jesus, you've been reconciled to God. Now by the power of the Holy Spirit, you're walking in a righteousness they can't touch until they have received Messiah. In the ancient plains of Shinar, an evil was born. The first world king, the prototype transhuman, the ultimate despot, Nimrod. In Babylon, the son of perdition devised the Shinar Directive, a plan to enslave humanity and make war against the God of Heaven. God's intervention at the Tower of Babel only delayed Nimrod's hellish plans, as the powers of Mystery Babylon gathered to create the new Tower of Babel and to prepare for the son of perdition's return. Heaven is issuing a clarion call to the remnant. The Shinar Directive will reveal the strategies of the enemy that will help you untangle yourself from them and become the victorious church. It is time for the remnant to wake up, discern the times, and be infused with Heaven's power to withstand The Shinar Directive by Dr. Michael Lake. Get your copy today at kingdomintelligencebriefing.com that's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.